Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. So we're going to start. Hello, everyone. I'm Marjorie Rosenberg from the IATFL Membership Committee of IATFL. On behalf of IATFL, I would like to welcome all of you to this 11th webinar in our series with Professor Ron Carter, who will talk about Internet English, the changing English language, and its implications for teaching. Ron Carter is Research Professor of Modern English Language at Nottingham University, UK. He's chair of the Education and ELT Publishing Committee for Cambridge University Press, a member of the Operating Board of the Press, and an affiliated lecturer in the Faculty of Modern and Medieval Languages, University of Cambridge. Ron's main interests, research interests, are in the broad field of applied linguistics and ELT. This includes work on corpus and computational linguistics, discourse-based grammar, English vocabulary, and the interface between language and literature. He has written, co-authored, edited, and co-edited over 40 books and over 100 articles. English Grammar Today with Mike McCarthy, Geraldine Mark, and Ann O'Keefe, and an A to Z Grammar of English for Intermediate Language Learners with accompanying workbook was, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2011. Ron has regularly worked abroad and has lectured in over 40 countries worldwide. He has been an active member of the IATFL Advisory Council. Before we begin, I would just like to say that this webinar would not be possible without the support of IATFL and without our tech hosts. And I would like to thank Mercedes Viola for her invaluable support today. And to the participants. If you have a question, please write it into the Q&A pod on the screen, which is below the slides, rather than into the chat box. At the end, Ron will endeavor to answer as many questions as possible. We will also make the slides from today's webinar available for one week on the ITEFL website. They will then be moved to the archives for members to view along with the recording, which will go into the archives after the webinar. As website updates are done by ITEFL head office, both the slides and the recording will not be available until next week. And now, over to Ron. Thank you very much, uh, Marjorie. I hope everyone can <coughs> hear me OK. Um, we're, we're going to look today at a, at a topic which is, um, I think, very current and of particular interest to English language teachers. Um, and I'd like also to offer my thanks to IATFL for making this seminar possible and for allowing me to convey a few thoughts to you and to discuss things with you. The um, internet is changing our lives and changing the way the English language is working and it's doing it at a very fast pace. Um, if we just stop and think for a moment about the number of emails that are sent and received every day, the figures are quite remarkable. It, it runs to several billion emails per day. There are estimates that we send and receive approximately 6 billion SMS texts, text messages per day. That averages out at something like uh, between 30 and 60 text messages per day each on average. And in the case of um, younger users, that can go to something like 60 per day. In the case of YouTube, um, we're talking about something like three to four billion views per day with something like 65 hours of YouTube video uploaded every minute. Uh, the figures are, are quite remarkable and it, it's no surprise that as a result of this phenomenon and its ubiquity and pervasiveness that the language is, is changing. Some of these forms of new language you will have been more familiar with. Um, they're, they're relatively common and are discussed quite widely in our various communities, newspapers, television and so on. 
Um, but you know, here they are. Um, very commonly, we are talking about various kinds of um, abbreviation uh, in standard language forms. Those abbreviations take the form of logograms, like today, non-standard forms of non-standard spellings, abbreviations of various kinds, BFN, for example, bye for now, OMG, oh my god, TTYL, um, talk to you later. And of course, various omissions of words. Look at the way excellent is most commonly used in a lot of texts. The absence of um, a visual space to communicate with each other means that emoticons are used a lot. So various kinds of symbols are used to substitute for facial expressions and for the use of visual spaces between each other. And I've, I've put there one or two examples of them. Punctuation is very variable in a lot of um, internet communication, not least because we are communicating with each other very quickly and punctuation often may seem not necessary, although it can lead to difficulties and ambiguities. Sometimes punctuation is used, but it has a different function from in standard forms. I could spend a lot of time looking at this kind of new language, and we could spend a lot of time looking at new words like e-commerce, e-banking, download, uh, netiquette, those kinds of vocabulary items, which of course are um, entering the language and have entered the language, and new vocabulary items like this are entering the language all the time. I think I'm going to focus rather more in this webinar on the more subtle, less visible changes to the language that are more to do with the way in which grammatical patterns and discourse patterns are changing the way we are communicating in Internet English. One of the key questions I'd like to address is the extent to which Internet English is informal or formal uh, and where the continuum is. Are we looking at forms of English which are closer to speech or closer to writing? Quite a bit of email and texting and internet communication generally takes place in real time, which makes it close to spoken language. In written language, as we know, you, you have more time and space to construct what you want to say and what you want to write. And there's, a, there's an absence of face-to-face -face contact. Well, there's an absence of face-to-face -face contact in a lot of texts and emails, and that's why we have emoticons to fill that space. But a lot of internet communication is very close to real time. It's very close to, to real conversation. We are typing almost in real time. We are communicating instantaneously. And we can be interrupted while we're type it, typing in chat rooms, for example. There can be overlaps. Uh, there can be disruption to turn taking, which is very, very similar to the kinds of effects produced in everyday conversation as we speak with one another. Some forms of internet communication, such as blogs and more formal emails, are, of course, written in order to be more permanent. A lot of internet communication is essentially temporary and impermanent in form. But blogs are an example of text which are much, much closer to writing. So we're talking about a mixed medium um, along a continuum from formal to informal. But even having said that, a lot of internet communication is essentially in instant and it's interactive and it, it prompts interactivity between users. Uh, with colleagues at the University of Nottingham and at the University of Cambridge and at Cambridge University Press, I've been working recently on an extension to the Cambridge English Corpus, which is a large two billion word corpus of English, which underpins a lot of teaching materials for the press, on a, a, an e-language corpus called CANELC stands for the Cambridge and Nottingham e-language corpus. It's a corpus of a million words, 
Most e-language corpora um, are bespoke corpora. In other words, you, you have a corpora of text or a corpora of blogs or a corpora of Twitter feeds or a corpora or you have corpora of, of chat room data. CanElk is a mixture of all of these different forms collected in such a way that we can access it very quickly to enable us to differentiate between different types of communication and see how language varies from one e-medium of communication to another. Sadly, at the moment, like a lot of corpora, the CanElk corpus is not available, but we, we hope that in due course it will be made available and at the very least examples put on the web for us all to explore. But please don't contact me for access because at the current moment it's not available for public access. Here's some examples of um, e-language from the Canal Corpus. Here's a, a Twitter feed. Um, what's very interesting about this, and I'll, I'll read it first, is the use of ellipsis. Ellipsis is very, very common in a lot of um, internet communication. It's probably the grammatical form which is the most pervasive. And ellipsis is when we omit um, key subjects, usually pronouns and nouns, and often the verb which comes, the main verb which follows the um, subject pronoun or noun. Um, we don't do this in writing, at least very rarely, but it's very common in speech. But this is actually written, not spoken communication. And it's an example of that hybrid form I've been identifying between speech and writing. So in this Twitter feed, we get when I'm in writing mode, I get up earlier and earlier, 3.45 this morning, bonkers. Trouble is, it means I'm ready for bed at 7. So instead of saying the trouble is, it's trouble is. This is a text message sent between female friends. Ha ha ha, we'll be over in 10. I will be over in 10 minutes to decide a plan for the day. So there's pronouns, sometimes definite articles, sometimes verbs omitted. Pop the kettle on for can you pop the kettle on? Quite fancy tea for I quite fancy tea. Should I bring some cow juice with me? Now cow juice is uh, an example of what's quite common in a lot of internet communication, particularly in texts and emails, kind of verbal play, playing with words, joking. Cow juice is of course milk. We shouldn't exaggerate, however, and this is the example of, this is the um, particular advantage of the Canelk corpus, is that it looks at lots of different uh, varieties. Here's an email message sent from uh, someone who is a little older than many of the participants that we have collected uh, text messages and emails from. And I must admit, um, as an old man myself, I write a little bit like this. Look how formal this is and look how different it is from the Twitter feed and the text message uh, previously. Um, what is happening tonight? This is an email message sent from a father to his son's phone. What is happening tonight? Are you going over to Jake's and then on to the concert? Do you need picking up and at what time? So this is much more standard grammar, this is much more formal, this is something much more associated with writing. You can imagine it having been having taken longer to construct, there's correct punctuation, there's, que there's question marks and so on. And I must admit my own children make fun of me when I write emails or text messages like this which are far too formal and take far too long to construct. But it's evidence of the uh, variety of internet English. We, we, mustn't, we, we must resist the temptation to overgeneralize too much. Here's some sample um, SMS texts and I've, I've put these in in order simply to show you that they are common in professional communication. Um, the first example is of simple business communication, people in a small business communicating with each other. Um, about um, pieces of, of um, furniture and related photography items. And in the second one, this is more intimate uh, and more socialising, friends just talking to each other. Notice the emoticons, notice the, example in the, notice the example in the second text 
of you, simply a letter standing for the personal pronoun you. Notice also the kiss, and I'll, I'll come back to the use of kisses in emails and texts in a moment. But it's a, it's a continuum of informality here, um, and ranging from professional purposes to everyday, friendly, intimate chat. One thing a computer corpus can enable you to do is very quickly identify, often just at a press of the mouse, a click of the mouse, um, the most frequent words and phrases in your corpus. And I've done this here for, for Panelk. It's a little bit difficult to read, and, but you know, don't forget you can come back and look at the um, slides at a later date. As Marjorie has said, iTeffel makes them available and you can come back and scrutinize these frequency lists in greater detail and hopefully in a bit more close up um, at a later stage if you wish. But it is interesting that, and perhaps not surprising, that personal pronouns and the definite article are, are very common. That the word at, for example, is, is very common. Um, you'd, you'd, you'd expect that in, in this type of, of, of list. Um, also common are in this list of phrases here. On the, on the left, the two columns, the top, first top 50 is of individual words, and on the right-hand side, um, there are examples of phrases. Um, I'll just highlight um, a couple of words that interest me. Um, the extent to which kisses are used. Um, a kiss is the 38th most frequent item. Is it a word or not a word? I, I don't know. It's certainly a, a, a symbol. Um, that's very, very frequent out of one million words in the corpus. I'll come back to that. So is very interesting too. Um, it, it's a word that functions obviously as a um, a modifying adverb in the sense of I'm, I'm so busy or it's so boring and in that sense of course it's common but in the internet corpus we have in Canelk it also functions to indicate a transition from one topic to another um, or an attempt to switch from one part of an exchange to another part of it to an exchange um, you know, if I'm lecturing, for example, I might say, so we've covered the 19th century, now I'm moving on to the 20th century. Um, that kind of so in writing would indicate a new paragraph almost. But of course, we don't have paragraphs when we when we speak. And so is very much a, 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 a spoken item. It functions in a lot of in, Internet English as if it were a spoken transition between one topic and another. It functions almost as if it's punctuation, um, almost as if it, it's allowing a new paragraph to emerge, even if it doesn't actually signal in a text or an email a new paragraph. It's a, one of these very, very interesting uh, bits of grammar, uh, discourse grammar. It's a discourse marker, if you like, um, facilitating this type of uh, transition and topic transition. So in terms of um, the most frequent words in the Canel corpus, we've mentioned, and no one will be too surprised by, the presence of personal pronouns, demonstratives like this and that that point to um, particular items that speaker stroke writers are referring to. We also, when we communicate by email and particularly by text, um, are referring to personal, immediate and real-time circumstances and contexts. So it won't surprise you in that second list to see that there are lots of phrases like this week, um, next week, next year, at the moment, last night, and so on. This underlines the 
instantaneity, the immediacy of a lot of internet English communication. I've mentioned discourse markers functioning for punctuation, and I've mentioned kisses. Um, kisses are very common, uh, as I've already mentioned, and I'm interested in what people are doing when they put kisses on the end of texts and emails. You know, I've had um, emails from uh, younger female colleagues in my own department that for an old man like me are rather disturbing to receive a number of uh, kisses along the bottom. In fact, what is happening is, is essentially a kind of informal friendliness. It's become more of a convention to say, look, I'm, I'm here, th this is not too serious, this is a, a friendly communication. But it's on the increase and sometimes men use kisses to each other. Sometimes more than one kiss is used, sometimes three kisses are used. It's a very, very interesting phenomenon. It's part of this issue of how do you fill the space in the gaps between internet communication when you can't see someone. When we communicate in spoken, most spoken communication involves face-to-face -face contact. People are literally in your face, you can see them. But the chatty communication of email and texts doesn't allow that, even though the instantaneous nature of the communication encourages chattiness, there isn't the face-to-face -face contact. Maybe kisses is some way of people being able to show that they are in contact. There's a certain physicality about it. This is an example, a, a typical example from um, chat room data that we have collected from uh, the Canal corpus. You can see there, for example, everything that we've been talking about so far. Um, the length of the utterance is how quickly you can type very often. You can see the um, use of almost deliberate misspellings or conventions of spelling that are specific to this type of communication. Gotta for got to. TTYL, talk to you later, abbreviations we've mentioned. Talk to you soon, uh, ellipsis we've mentioned. Um, which means tomorrow right. Now that's very interesting. Here we are opening a clause with a relative pronoun. And in the example right at the end, or the penultimate example, because we're seeing David, we are opening a clause with a conjunction. Now these are dependent clauses that stand as if they were independent. Very interesting and very unusual, but it's very common in everyday conversation. It's a very standard feature of spoken grammar, even though here, of course, we are writing. And it underlines this point that I'm trying to make that um, the nature of a lot of internet English is that of informal communication, chatty communication, closer to spoken grammar than to written grammar. Also um, very common is um, the use of vagueness in texting. Let's look at this example. I'll, I'll read it a couple of times because once again this underlines the um, features of a lot of internet communication that we have been discussing. Um, here's someone, I think it's a, a friend, texting another friend about a meeting that they're having and I think going to an event later that evening. Hi, been up to ears with marking. You'll see it's a, it's a teacher. Nearly done. VV tired. Very, very tired. Your work okay. So you are for your. Your work, WK, work okay. Re tonight, with regard to tonight, you could say, if it were very formal. Mary's keen, no apostrophe. And I am kind of. I am kind of keen. What I've put there and highlighted in green is the, is the vagueness. 
I'll pick you up at, I don't know, 6.45 p.m. That'll give enough time to park and that, followed by a kiss. Why the vagueness? Uh, this is something that is a phenomenon of a lot of spoken communication, though here, of course, it's written. Uh, we don't find vagueness of this kind at all common in standard written English. So although it's written here, it's a feature or set of features more closely associated with um, spoken communication than with written communication. Now, th this is an example of British English. It could well be that this is a, a, a particular feature associated with British culture. Uh, certainly, in my experience, vagueness is used where you don't want to appear too definite. You don't want to appear too precise. You don't want to appear as if you know everything. It's connected with a form of politeness, with a form of modesty. It may be uniquely British. Is it present in other languages? Is it present in other Englishes? What I can say is it's very common in a lot of texting between friends. And it's almost as if these two friends here, although they're making arrangements, don't want to tell the other too definitely what to do. Hence all the examples of kind of and saying, I'll pick you up at, I don't know, 6.45 p.m. It's almost as if that's a question. Shall I pick you up at 6.45? But it's a statement followed by, I don't know, or I don't know, which seems to soften the statement, almost turn it into a question as a result of the vagueness. Vagueness is, is really very common in a lot of uh, texting, and I underline not common, um, with the exception of words like uh, approximately, um, in most written communication, certainly in most formal communication, certainly in most academic communication. But I'm trying to reduce the information from the poll that I've got and the poll is very interesting I can't can everyone see the um, can everyone see the slide okay I hope they can I say I've been able to reduce it now thank you um, so what are some of these differences between different types of internet English different types of e-communication in the um, canal corpus now, one thing we can say about a lot of emails and SMS messages is that, by and large, they're written for people, written to and by people who know each other. Um, that affects how we communicate. It, it, may, it may be that um, we can be more informal with those that we know. Although, having said that, email itself, as you know, has a very wide range from very informal emails to very formal emails. But by and large, we're emailing people we do know. Where we don't know them, then that obviously affects the nature of the communication. So how well you know someone is a crucial contextual factor, a crucial almost social communicative factor in how we exchange. A lot of SMS messages, however, are from lists of people we already have on our phone and who we already know. And that affects the nature of the communication. Maybe to some degree it, expects, it, it, it explains the quite extensive informality I've been describing. The use of uh, Twitter and SMS too is something that is constrained by space. You know, Twitter, we know there are a limited number of characters we can use. SMS, we tend not to write long, detailed messages in it, SMS. That they function for short messages, which is what SMS means. Um, it, it has a, a function of almost immediate, instant communication. Therefore, maybe we use less hedging. And maybe we can be much more direct sometimes in some communications. Although, again, we must beware of generalizing too much because 
vagueness is not a direct form, it's a quite indirect form. So there's a lot that we need to study in terms of the grammar of um, emails and SMS messages. And I'm very conscious that there's still a lot of work to be done to understand better uh, the changing nature of the language and the way in which the language can vary across different forms and even within the same forms. By and large, however, um, blogs and tweets are more public. Um, the readers are often unknown and distant. And as a result, I think we're much, much more careful in how we construct language, more formal, it, it approximates much more closely standard written communication. But you know, once again, beware of generalizations. The language of blogs varies quite a lot according to audience and purpose. A blog on a BBC website, you know, a public broadcaster, would be very different from a blog, let's say, on a, on a, on a, on a, a website for football supporters. So there are very considerable differences, even though uh, we tried in this webinar to make some generalizations and highlight some contextual differences between different types of media. Here's an example of a, of, of a blog, um, just to show you something of the range of different types of blogs you can get. And you will all know this from having read blogs yourselves. You can sometimes get very speakerly writers and very writerly speakers. And it is a continuum. Uh, here's a blog which is a, a kind of composite from several of the blogs that we've been analysing. Um, notice how the discourse markers at the beginning right, so, um, have a function of attracting the attention, almost as if you're speaking to someone. It's very chatty, it's very interactive, it grabs attention, um, it foregrounds the speaker rather than the writer, even though this is written. Right, so, there I was, sitting in Mick Jagger's kitchen while he went about making us both afternoon tea. Well, you can imagine how long it took to get him to talk about the band's latest album. Exactly, you've got it, over two minutes. You see, it sounds like a conversation, even though it's written. It's a very effective piece of blog journalism. Even the word exactly there, which I've highlighted in green, is almost as if someone's replying. Yeah? IATF is the best organization for teachers in the world. Exactly. You know, it has that function of agreeing with someone, almost as if the writer is taking part in a dialogue. And this dialogic nature um, of uh, blogs, and indeed dialogic nature of a lot of email communication and internet communication, uh, is what I think is a particular challenge for teachers to understand and to insert and embed appropriately within our, within our teaching. I'll leave this one for you to have a look at, I'm just reminding you again that you can come back and see the slides at a later stage. This is an example from David Crystal's book, Internet Linguistics, and the, the um, blog here is, is one that David cites, and you might want to just come back and look at the punctuation and ask yourselves, you know, what use has been made of the dashes here? Um, it's a very interesting use of punct punctuation seems to allow the speaker to change direction quickly. What do you think? Does it? Um, what about the clauses? Now, there, there are quite a lot of different clauses, and they're not sequenced in the ways that they normally are in, or most commonly are, in written communication. Um, it's a very interesting bit of text to come back at, and it's one of these examples, almost like a hybrid form between spoken and written. It's clearly written, but the speaker, sorry, the writer is writing almost as if they're speaking. It does sound a bit like a dialogue. And look at the use of oh yes in the middle there. That insertion of oh yes, it's like an exclamation, makes you stop and listen even though you're reading. It has a very, very interesting function. And do look at David Crystal's book on internet linguistics. It has some very, very interesting observations along the kinds of lines that we've been looking at uh, this morning this afternoon, sorry, this afternoon here anyway in, in the UK. Um, and again, I'll, I'll leave, conscious of time, I'll, I'll leave this slide too for you to have a look at, but 
I've, I've isolated 30 forms commonly associated with hedging and hedging as you know is used uh, often to modify statements so that they appear more polite or less assertive. Um, they're more common I think in, in, in written language than in spoken language and you'll see that the analysis we've done seems to suggest that if you just take the top 10 hedges there they're underused in CANELC which makes CANELC closer to um, uh, spoken language but overused compared with the written British national corpus so very interesting uh, example there of a particular form of language that you can come back and study and think about and then look at examples yourselves of texts of emails of blogs of chat room data and so on and see whether you think it's in terms of hedging uh, more spoken or more written In Internet Linguistics, David Crystal argues that Internet language is better seen as writing that is close to speech, but which is identical to neither writing, sorry, which is identical to neither speech nor writing. He points out that it shares features of both speech and writing, but does things that neither of the other mediums can do. Very interesting statement, and it summarizes, I think, very nicely where we've got to so far. The quotation from Naomi Barron is rather more pessimistic. Um, it's a very interesting book called Always On, and it, 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 it's a book really about 24-hour communication, you know, that we, are, we always have our phones on, we're, we're always in permanent communication. And that too uh, affects fundamentally the way we communicate and the way the language can change, and can change very rapidly. And she takes the example of the quasi-anarchy of medieval and renaissance England and suggests that in a few years time we may have variant spellings because the internet has changed things so much that the word nice may end up being spelt in three or four different ways just like it did in medieval England uh, in, in medieval English so two interesting books there but there's a list of um, titles that I put in the final slide you might want to come back and look at. They suggest all kinds of further reading that you might want to do. Uh, but those two books in particular will be of interest, I'm sure. I've only concentrated on limited features of language. Um, there's a lot more we could say about um, deictic markers and discourse markers, ellipsis, modality, a lot more we could say about punctuation, a lot more we could say about spokenness and e-language and turn-taking. All I think I'm trying to highlight here is that these are forms we are beginning to better understand. I'm not saying we, we have full understanding by any means at this stage. And there are things also that we need to go on to investigate and think about further. For example, a lot of internet communication is multimodal. Uh, the language often sits alongside pictures. Um, there's haptic communication. People often use, as we've said, kisses or words like hugs to suggest physical proximity in their use of language. We're often humorous. We often have banter and wordplay in internet communication. Why is that? Celebrities often use Twitter to construct an identity um, for themselves. How is this done? How is the language used? What are they doing? What are they not saying about themselves? What are the dangers of anonymity in a lot of this, uh, in terms of the way in which language is used to threaten people, for example? And please note you know, that I've been looking at examples of British English, because that's the corpus we have at the moment, and I've taken examples from American English. Um, English as a lingua franca is crucial, as we know. It, it's a, a major, major form of communication through English internationally. Um, maybe we also need to extend our scrutiny of these forms into other Englishes and look at parallels, differences and distinctions. What are some of the implications for um, teaching? This is much, much more difficult. Um, what we do know is that digital technologies are here to stay. Um, they're pervasive. Um, tablets, are widely used in classrooms, or in, 
in many parts of the world and will be used more. Smartphones are often used to accompany student investigation, sometimes used for homework. They bring the real world and authentic language into the classroom and they take the classroom into the real world. Just for one example, you can use a tablet to instantly access current news within a class. Um, recent events can be foregrounded quickly for discussion. Um, we can also very quickly, learners can also publish, present and create for real local audiences very quickly and post it for almost immediate viewing or for the class to view the same evening, the following morning. It creates a much more participatory and involved classroom culture. Uh, it leads to much greater motivation on the part of students or can lead to much greater uh, motivation on the part of students. Tablet smartphones, webcams, FaceTime, Skype, video conferencing are becoming much, much more standardised. They're becoming gradually more standardised too in classrooms. Um, notice too here that this, those first two bullet points imply that the visual and the verbal are put much more closely together. Uh, there's a lot, for example, in spoken communication that involves gestures. Um, for example, which maybe have written equivalents. And when we video conference, it's not just what we write, it's what we say. It's not just say, it's what we write. So there, there's a constant overlap between the verbal and the visual. And better understanding this type of verbal visual communication is going to be crucial for 21st century communication because Skype is going to increase. FaceTime is going to increase. Video conferencing is going to increase. So preparing our students for this kind of world involves in part at least helping to understand better this continuum between spoken and written, between the verbal and the visual, and maybe even the way in which the written and the spoken interface each other. The flipped classroom is here. What does this mean? Well, it certainly means greater learner autonomy. It means that programs for learning are more personalized and more individualized. Um, there's an increase in adaptive learning and adaptive testing. Potentially positives, but challenges for teachers here. What does this mean in terms of classroom management interactivity? What, ex what kinds of learner motivation are stimulated by increased use of digital communication? Will it see a decrease in formality in language use? Because quite a lot of internet communication, as we've seen, tends towards the informal and tends towards the instantaneous. It tends towards the immediate. What are the dangers here? What are the dangers for language and language standards? Are there real risks that students might suddenly start writing dunno? D-U-N-N-O, because they've seen it so frequently or have started to write it themselves so frequently. So there are several challenges here for the, for, for the, for the teacher. Freeware is increasingly common um, on internet sites. Quite a lot of sites, for example, allow free grammar materials for downloading. Um, not all those sites are in formal English. Quite a lot are in very informal English. So students are exposed to a much greater variety of access to different forms of English than maybe they were previously. And this is represents, I think, a very real challenge for the teacher in terms of filtering different kinds of English, in terms of managing their classrooms and in terms of preparing students adequately for 21st century communication. So conclusions. I'm conscious we've got about 15 minutes to go and there will be questions that I will try to uh, answer and discuss with you. What can we conclude? Well, we conclude that the internet is changing very fast how we communicate. But that change will always be faster in some places than others, inevitably. And the change won't happen unless the culture is prepared for the change. So however pervasive those changes, classrooms will only embody these kinds of digital devices extensively 
when the culture of those classrooms is prepared for it. So we shouldn't suddenly think that the internet and internet English is suddenly going to take over, but we do need to be prepared for it, bearing in mind those figures of the extent of use that I gave you at the very beginning of the webinar. Teaching and learning styles, therefore, must change and will change, and sometimes they will change in parallel with both the changes in the language and the media for the language. And that brings us back to the main theme of this webinar, the, the overlaps and continuum between speech and writing, between formality and informality. And I think what we can conclude, given all the variations we've seen, and given my own concern not to overgeneralize, is that nonetheless there is a marked increase in informality in the uses of vocabulary, in the uses of text structures, and in the uses of grammar and discourse. Finally, um, bearing in mind too that we, we will always adjust our language according to who we know, who we're writing for, the audience, the context, and so on. Uh, I must underline that I've taken examples from British and US, US English. It's very important that you know, we do recognize this and that other Englishes are very important, but they have other, other conventions and other ways of communicating. And that is something we might need to return to uh, at a subsequent um, a webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, I've given you three kisses at the end. Not sure quite what the implications of that might be. But you'll remember from the list of um, frequent words that kisses are very, very frequent indeed. Uh, I may have started a new convention altogether for putting kisses at the end of webinars. Go back and have a look at some of these texts. Um, I've put two in blue that I think teachers will find very interesting because they cover a lot of the territory that we have discussed in the, let in the latter part of the webinar. Um, Graham Stanley's um, Language Learning with Technology, just published uh, last year, and Walker and White's um, Technology Enhanced Language Learning, two very, very interesting books that cover a lot of very important territory. I've mentioned uh, David Crystal's books on language and the internet, um, others there, you, know, you, you may want to follow up uh, depending on what your interests are. Um, Ruth Page, their stories and social media is a very interesting study of how um, people present themselves, um, for example, in social media, um, in internet communication, in Twitter, in blogs, and so on. That, that's a more sociological study, but a very interesting one nonetheless. And that brings me to the end. Uh, I've, I've run over slightly, but we still have something like 12 minutes uh, for me to um, take any questions and to uh, look at polls with you and to um, bring things to a conclusion. So Marjorie, I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Ron. And it's the first time we've gotten kisses from a presenter. This is really special. Uh, we have two polls. Do you want to do the one about corpus first, Ron? Yeah. OK, Mercedes, can you show us that poll? OK. That's that's interesting to see that there is a there is a, an awareness of corpora and of corpus based descriptions of English. Okay, thank you. Do we have and a lot of people a lot of people seeing the um, effects of internet English as more positive than negative, if I'm reading the poll correctly. Okay, this is the next one. Yeah. That's good. You know, I, I'm probably in the, in the 33 percent, not sure, <laughs> but there are times and days where I think much more positively about things. So um, generally, I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm between A and C there. But interesting. Yeah. Th thank you for those who took part in the poll. Well, Matt's comment here in the chat box is, I think any use of language is positive. And I think we're thinking as uh, because we teach English as a second language. So we're very happy when they actually use English. Whether this is the same in a country where English is, is the L1 is the question. And that's come up from Sylvia in Canada. But let's yes. take a look at some of the questions here. Uh, trying to go back to the first one. Okay, Joanne asked, 
is it because Twitter limit is the number of characters? In other words, do we abbreviate because Twitter eliminates this? Yeah, we do. Um, but we also abbreviate in texts, and we increasingly abbreviate in emails as well, particularly when we're sending emails to friends. Except in the case of old men like me who send emails in very formal, very formal English, even to uh, people I know. But obviously, the medium itself and the fact that only 160 characters allows uh, is one of the main reasons why uh, tweets do involve abbreviations. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, I see my camera's frozen. I don't think it matters. Okay, and Matt asked, is it better to use correct grammar in tweets? Could you repeat that, Marjorie? Uh, can you see the questions? Yeah. If you click on presenter's view, can you see the questions as well? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so Matt's is, is it better to use correct grammar in tweets? Oh, okay. Um, that's a very good question. It, I suppose it depends what your purpose is in tweeting. Um, very often tweets are um, just sending on messages to friends, like retweeting. Maybe it doesn't matter too much then. But increasingly, businesses and corporations are using tweets for promotional purposes. And I'd have guessed there, given that the tweets would be much more public, you'd need to be uh, much more careful about the grammar that you used. So it's often a case of purpose and audience again, isn't it? We've, we've come back to this many times. But it's a very good question, Matt. Thank you. And Matt, is another good question. Do you need permission from Twitter users to include their, tweet, include their tweets in the corpus? Um, we have got permission from the Twitter users, yeah. All of the tweets in the corpus that we've got, um, we have contacted the Twitter users, and we have been allowed to use them by them. A lot of people said no, however, so it was hard work collecting the corpus. Very interesting. Okay, the next question is, if the language used is communicatively effective within the language community one communicates in, is it still valid as a variant of English, much like the regional differences in the English-speaking world? And then I'm not sure about my role as a teacher in terms of introducing it to my classroom unless it's a special request from my students. I'm just reading this now, Marjorie. Yeah. Uh, is it then still valid to very much like reading? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. I, I, I think it's something you need to discuss with your students. Um, I think what, one of the most in, important things you can do with students is just make them aware um, of the different forms of electronic and e-communication, internet English generally. Um, help them to look at um, the, the different forms of vocabulary and grammar that occur uh, so that they can make their own choices about how they communicate what's appropriate in a classroom, what's appropriate for examinations, what's appropriate for writing to friends, and so on. And it will, of course, be different um, if we're in a first language community, if we're in communities where English is a second language, and different again if we're in a community where English is a foreign language. So again, we have to be um, uh, careful in terms of uh, generalization. But generally, I rather like the idea of discussing this kind of language with students and enhancing their own awareness and consciousness of how we communicate using these forms. And they will often be as, as knowledgeable, if not more knowledgeable, than us. And that, that in itself is an interesting question for how we manage the discussion. Okay, great. We have Sergio from Spain. Are there any major differences between US e-language and UK e-language? Is e-language significantly different, different in different varieties of English? Good question. Um, the, the, the British English involves a lot more vagueness um, and a lot more um, indirectness in communication. Um, American English, in American English generally, at least in the examples that we've got and we have looked at, there's much less of a problem in speaking more directly and, and not hedging and in communicating 
um, uh, without feeling they need to modify too much what is what is said. Um, but the variations are, are are slight, and there are many more things that American English and British English has in common than it doesn't. But good question. Hmm. And there's a question uh, from Joanne, Switzerland. The blog, Speakerly Writers and Writerly Speakers, is this an example of a specific type of blog genre? I, I think the example was there are so many different types of blog. I, I tried to put together a composite. So it was one I made up myself that brought in many of the features that are common in a lot of blogs. I think if you go back to the text and have a look at it, back to the slide and have a look at it, um, that particular blog is um, the kind of thing that you often find journalists doing um, who are trying to communicate in a very interactive, dialogic way with their readers. Uh, and it's very skillful, it's very hard to do, to write in such a way as if you were having a dialogue with your readers. Um, advertisers are very good at doing this. Um, but we find it's also something that occurs in blogs as well. Okay. We're getting uh, very close to the end. I'm going to try to find a couple of questions. We have Halima from Uzbekistan. Ron, would you speak about Facebook pages too? So I guess the language. Is that similar to the... Yeah, I, I should have said at the very beginning that we were not allowed to collect Facebook data. Um, okay. So Facebook... Is, is the one area of internet English that we haven't got examples of in the corpus. We, we've collected private examples, um, but making the corpus itself was impossible because one of the problems with Facebook is people have so many friends and you have to get permission from all the friends for every single uh, statement that you make. And it's just too complicated at the moment. And plus, Facebook are very protective of their data. It may be that future corpora of e-language will have access to Facebook. It's a good question because Facebook is very, very widely used, and we need to understand better the language of Facebook. So thank you for that question. OK. Um, OK, I've got um, Musab from Turkey. Should we look at ELT from the window of sociolinguistics or that of applied linguistics? Not sure if this fits in with what you've been talking about. I think it's it, any any study of internet communication is is a kind of applied linguistics because we're we're looking at what we can learn from the medium of internet internet English that has implications for us as teachers and for how we see the language and use the language and encourage students to use the language in classrooms and outside classrooms. So I'd have thought more applied linguistics. OK. I'd like to address Alan's question, and then I think we can do one more and we'll have to stop. So Alan says, formality, informality has always been a continuum. But do you sense, I just lost it, just lost the question. Um, Mercedes, did you take it off? Yeah, I, I did by mistake, but I read it oh, to the did, end. Right. It's a very do good you question have it? from Alan. Um, I do. I, I do think a tipping point has, has reached. It, it's hard to give, you know, absolutely incontrovertible evidence in support of it. But I do think the language has tipped into more informal modes in the course of the last 10, 15 years. And, and this is the language internationally, uh, as well as just British English and American English, which I've studied. Um, if you look at, for example, something like newspapers, um, from 50 years ago, some of the clause patterns and clause structures are just not used today. Um, we've become much more informal, much more interactive, much more um, reader and listener sensitive in the way we use language. So I think a, a kind of tipping point has been passed, yeah. But, um, you know, other people will disagree with me. Right, Ron, do we have an extra five minutes for a couple of questions? Yeah. Does that work with you? Okay, Muhammad from Saudi Arabia has asked, how do you see the future of standard language? Future of standard language is, is healthy um, because it's policed in many ways by examinations. Um, and examinations are always to a degree, to a high degree, um, tests of standard language and standard language use. Um, so the future of, of standard language is whatever our views of 
what standard language is. Standard language is, is for teachers often managed by examination boards and managed by the examinations that we want our students to take and pass. So in that sense, I think examination boards police the language and, and in one sense, of course, are also ensuring the language doesn't change very, very quickly. But as we also know, um, examination boards are taking on board many, many more oral tests and are finding ways of assessing spoken English. And that's much more of a challenge for actually what constitutes correctness in spoken grammar as opposed to correctness in written grammar. And I think there's a lot of work that is needed to be done along this continuum that I've been describing. I, I like that question. It, it's, it's, it's a very difficult one to answer, and it's one we all need to think about quite a lot. Okay, thank you. We have Hannah from Lithuania. Hi, Ron. Thanks for the interesting webinar. Could you tell us some more about the corpus you mentioned, how it's being compiled? Are people happy to share their private SMS or emails? And when do you think public might get access to this resource? I think that there is always a, a, a problem when publishers put a corpus together because they invest a lot of money in it. They, they want to use it for, um, they want to use it to, to inform um, the language materials they use, dictionaries and grammars and, and, and so on. They also, for com commercial reasons, don't want to make it too public too soon. Um, but uh, I do know um, that, that Cambridge is looking at ways of making samples of the corpus uh, more available uh, for teachers to look at and for teacher development purposes. Um, but there will probably be more news next year. Okay. And then Jamie from UK, should formal and informal forms of English be taught simultaneously in classes? Uh, depends what your purposes are. <laughs> for, for examination purposes, you probably need to concentrate rather more on formal English. Um, but for communicative purposes outside the classroom, um, students need to know and be very well acquainted with informal forms. Okay, and the next one um, from Lorraine in Italy, what is your opinion about how teachers should filter the English language to their students? Yeah, very good question. I'm, I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Um, I, I think it's something for teachers to decide themselves. You know, w w teachers are in different communities of practice and there are different local cultures um, that determine, you know, that type of question and the answer to it. Um, uh, and I think teachers always do to a degree filter the language, but I, I like the kind of filtering that comes about as a result of increased language awareness, as I was discussing earlier. The more conscious your students are of different choices of English uh, and what those choices mean, uh, the more competent they will be as users of the language. So uh, we, we do have to filter, but we have to filter in a sensitive and awareness raising way. Okay, I think this last question would be very interesting to hear. Um, Hannah from Lithuania, do you think your own language has changed since studying internet English? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely ending. Oh, as a result of no, I, I I can't say no and I can't say yes. My my children would say that I still use English in exactly the same way when I use texts as I have always done. That I haven't changed at all. But generally speaking, I'm of course like everyone affected by the environment we're in. So when I write and when I speak and when I give lectures, I'm pretty certain. I am more informal in my use of language than I was 20 years ago. Okay, well, that's a wonderful answer. Ron, thank you so much. And for the extra five minutes, we had some fascinating questions here. And we didn't get to all. I was taking very part sorry. To the very interesting questions. And once again, thank you to IATEFL for um, making this possible. Yes, we're delighted that we can do this and continue doing this to spread the word around the world. Okay, can we go to the next slide, Mercedes, just to announce the next web webinar? So we've got a couple webinars coming up. We've got a BASIC webinar, Integrating Critical Thinking into Business English with John Hughes on Sunday, the 4th of May at 3 p.m. British Standard Time, uh, Summer Time, which is UK time. And the next IATEFL webinar is Motivation, Imagination, and L2 Identity with Jill Hadfield on Saturday, the 31st of May 
again at 3 p.m. UK time. Uh, please check the IATEFL website for more information and login details for these upcoming events. And thank everyone for taking part today. It was absolutely great. Ron, this was fascinating. And just finishing David Crystal's book on texting. So this is the perfect kind of roundup for all of that. And, and thank you for helping us all to you and to Mercedes as well. Well, thank you. We're, we're delighted to have you. And to Caroline Moore, who contacted you in the first place. We have to say thank you to Caroline. I think she's at a conference. There are a lot of conferences going on this weekend, so I think that's where some people are at the moment. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the weekend, and hope to see you at the next ITEFL webinar. And Ron, hope to see you in person at the next ITEFL conference. Okay. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Bye.